Um, hello everyone, I'm Sophia and I will let Kathleen open us up with a karakia today. Welcome to the room, everyone. Okay. Fakataka te hau ki te uru, fakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a makina kina ki te uta, ki a matara tara ki tai, e hi akeana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti he mauriora. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I'll just do a very quick Zoom housekeeping. Welcome to our today's session, uh, placemaking at Kayangora. Um, anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Sophia and I work at Catalyze and also work as a tech person for this Aqua Aqua series. Um, happy to welcome everyone. Thank you for showing up for our last session for this year. It's a little bit of a, oh, already. <laughs> um, so what do we do? We record this session so other people can watch it later, or maybe you would like to uh, review it again. Please ensure that you are on mute um, and please introduce yourself and ask questions in the chat. We will have some time for a discussion at the second part. So please write down your questions and get ready. Um, and if you put yourself on a gallery view, we will be able to see you and you will be able to see others as well. Yeah, that's all on my side. Back to Kathleen and have a good time. Cool. Thank you. Um, kia ora tato, ko Kathleen Waldock, toko ingwa. I'm the place man placemaking manager at Kainga Ora and I'll just hand over to Christine to quickly introduce herself before we go on. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, I'm Christine Olson and I am reasonably new to Kainga Ora. I've been there about four months, so a month before we went into lockdown and then um, and then in lockdown. Um, and my role is Chief Advisor Placemaking. Nice to see you all today. Thank you. And Sophia, we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, you've got a bit of the old and the new, which is a bit of a theme um, for the presentation together in that I'm feeling old. I've been with um, Kaing Ora and formerly HLC and formerly Housing New Zealand uh, for um, well over 15 years collectively. And as Christine said, she's the newbie. So together we're a great team with the old and the new. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. I know time is precious and also um, having face in front of a screen for those who've been doing it all day, every day for a while, it's, it can be a big ask. So really appreciate your your time today. Um, so we're just going to talk through what, uh, who or what Kainga Ora is, and also around um, why we do placemaking, um, what we're doing currently, but then also what we're looking to do in the future as well. And we'd really open up at the end then for a conversation with you because we'd really be keen to hear from you as well. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, Kainga Ora. We are um, a new, as in two years old, organisation, but made up of three um, fairly familiar organisations, which were Housing New Zealand, HLC, or Homes Land Community, it had a few different name iterations, or earlier Hobsonville Land Company, and then also Kiwi Build. So the three entities had been working together for a number of years, so it made sense that we all came together to work um, as one. From there, we then went, we were, we became Kainga Ora in October 2019. And then for the following year, we spent shaping the organization. How does it need to um, be structured to, to really fulfill what we're, um, we've been set up to do? So we've been spending time doing that and recruiting lots of new people to help us with that, like Christine. Um, and now um, really paving the way for the work we have ahead to ensure that we deliver what we set out to. And on that, I'll just go to the next page, Sophia, please. Um, so with Kaying Ora's establishment and the um, act that's around it, it's really given us the mandate um, to um, deliver further placemaking. Um, initially, as before Kaying Ora, it was sitting with the um, HLC organization, which was in those um, what we call large scale developments um, that some of you might be familiar with in Mount Roscoe, Northcote, Oranga, Mangere. We've also got a new one in Te Kaufata in the Waikato and the Porirua development 
development. So very much just focused on those new, those big development areas. And we we did it because we had support from the from our board but didn't have the mandate, which we have now, which is really um, kind of reaffirmed the importance of the space for us. And it's also um, on this slide, it's woven through our operating principles and our strategic outcomes as well. So the green is really highlighting where um, placemaking and um, also community development and engagement really contributes to achieving those outcomes. Um, going forward now that we're kind of order, it's also now looking at, well, what is placemaking um, now um, with with this new organization we are just focused on those bigger developments but should it be outside of that and more nationally as well so that's what christine will be talking to uh, further on um, the next few slides i'm just going to talk about um, a bit more about what we mean by placemaking as an organization currently and what that has um, some examples of what that looks like so we'll just go on to the next slide please Thank you. Um, so we really see it about shaping the, the spaces for people and, and with people. So we're taking the line from placemaking Aotearoa, which we really um, resonates with us. It's about people working together to make a place better for themselves and for the place together. So we do that through um, our master planning process where we, we're wanting to hear from community about um, the changes or improvements and aspirations they see for their community. Um, and then looking for opportunities where they can also have um, a voice in that in terms of if we're delivering new parks, for example, to have the voice in what those look like. And then we also do events and activities that we're also looking for um, um, participation in and also around um, while we do initiate a lot of things, we're also looking to support community with what they're initiating as well. So it's, it's a, bit of, a bit of both. We tend to initiate if it's something that... Um, it kind of helps respond with the, with the development timeline. So like the um, parks, for example, that's where we would initiate um, an activity around that. I'll go on to the next page. Um, so this is an example and I'll, I'll just be mindful of time because I could get carried away and talking about um, lots of them. Um, so ju just some examples here. Um, the Roscoe Theatre love to say goodbye. So this was something that our local theatre group in Mount Roscoe approached us to say that um, their, their youth and the families were, some of them were finding it quite a struggle to kind of come to terms with what was happening in the neighbourhood and wanted to be able to um, say goodbye to what they knew as their neighborhood um, and welcome in the new in a, in a, in a, um, through performance. And they asked if they could um, you know, use a site that um, has a house that was also significant to them. It was in the Toa, Toa Fraser movie uh, number three or number two, Roscoe, number two. So we, um, we uh, enabled that space to be used as well as supporting with some of the infrastructure that they needed. Um, and they also um, got funding from um, council and arts councils um, to support that and um, and I think also MSD funding to be able to employ a range of, of um, youth and others in that activity as well. So um, for us, it was um, very uh, meaningful and well aligned to us in that it was a way for community to really um, kind of understand, digest and absorb what was um, changing for them in the community and kind of move through that kind of grieving to you know, potentially and hopefully getting quite excited about the future in the neighborhood. Um, it was quite confronting for us as well, I, I have to say, you know, we didn't um, kind of shy away from it. We, we attended it to it, to it and, you know, we listened as they in, um, interpreted Dora, the Explorer song into F.U. Kainga Ora, you know, but that's what the, how they were feeling at the time and, and we'll take that. <laughs> um, the other uh, smaller one there, and you know, we all know that little can be big, is um, supporting the Te Ararata stream team in Mangari with um, the restoration work they're doing on, on the stream that they found that they would put in lots of plants and have lots of community involved in it. And a few days later, they would all be pulled out and not even to be replanted in their own gardens, but just as an act of vandalism and left there. So with ourselves and the art centre and the Te Ararata stream team is 
is um, bringing this sign to the stream to talk to, so people could read it and understand what the importance of the, the plants were and that it was for the community to um, look after it as well as take some responsibility for it. Uh, the bottom one is the um, in Auriri in Mangri as well. Um, there's a new park that will be uh, created, and in and that's one that we are we will be next year um, engaging with community on to inform that design. And in the meantime, we've created this space that we're calling an active connection, just an internal um, wording because it's very linear with um, fences on either side, but it's it cuts through two roads that otherwise you'd have to have a big loop to get through. So it's cutting through that connection, making it quicker for them to get through um, and start to get used to the idea of where the park will be. Um, and we've used it as an engagement opp opportunity to kind of um, signal that 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 this is going to be happening in the future, that we want to use the space to then start the conversation about what they want in the permanent park. Um, we put some little um, play elements in it and a path. We didn't want to, um, we didn't consider it would be of um, real value to go to community to design that space. You see in there's barbecues and everything, we actually pull back on it because um, kind of our um, advice from the urban designers around SIPTED was that it's not really a space you would encourage people to stay and play, but to go through. So that meant quite minimal, um, I guess, um, assets in there in the meantime. So it didn't feel like we actually had a lot to uh, go out to community with that, you know, if they were with ideas, then it would be like, actually, we can't do that, we can't do that. So we're wanting to do that with the with the main park. Um, saying that we have um, engaged with um, Kingsford Primary School, who have um, created the um, hoarding there that you see, and that was done uh, with um, Tiakitai Owaihua, who um, went to Kingsford Primary and talked about the history of the area and the designs that the school have created are those with, kind of with the white background um, and then we also um, collaborated with Dr Johnson who then brought all those pieces together so that runs the length of that um, connection and again to really um, bring some colour excitement um, and indication of, of what's to come and start to build those community relationships for when we are talking to them about that more permanent space. I'll just stop at this point in case there's any questions? And also just to grab a glass, uh, a bit of water right now. All right, I, I should have maybe checked the, the chat because I might not be actually in a position to say <laughs> questions right now, otherwise I'll leave them at the end. I'll just keep going if that's all right. Uh, next one, please. Oh, that's it. Okay, so uh, this one is an example of a park in Hobsonville Point where we worked with students at the secondary school um, around the design of a new space. Fano Korari is the name of the park. Um, and that school in particular and other schools like it have um, a project based learning approach where they want to where they want to um, find um, authentic projects where their work um, is is contributing to community and, and is, is um, authentic. So that really aligned with what we wanted to achieve as well. So we're able to work with them on the design of the park. Um, Manifeno are also involved in it as well in terms of the, the narrative for the park, the type of planting, the materials that we used. Um, the centre is a picture of um, a seating area that um, was designed by parents of a local daycare centre who had approached us asking if they could um, they, they also wanted to make a contribution to community um, and have a space that their um, kids could visit and um, kind of re, um, there's the intention is that they'll paint rocks and put them at the bottom of the, um, the piece of what was uh, driftwood from Uruwai Beach. Um, so uh, they, um, they came on board as well. We thought um, great timing, great opportunity. Um, and it was really um, kind of helpful and a lot of understandings for us all because when we um, kind of shared the idea of what the daycare centre was wanting to achieve and there um, that wooden structure they saw as a tanny and they were they had that um, conversation at their daycare um, when we spoke with Iwi about it they advised us well actually in this context it's not really appropriate but it, um, as a kaitiaki it would be so being able to learn about that and and make it more appropriate was really um, valuable having all all parties involved 
and this. I'll just move on to the next one, please, Sophia. Um, and then just another um, mix of, of activities here. Um, the uh, Digger Day um, is something that we've worked with um, Kaipadigi Community Facilities Trust, uh, Panuku, um, the local library and the town centre um, to deliver that event the last couple of years. And it was really from um, community saying, hey, it would be great to have an event that brought everybody together and as a way of saying thank you for putting up with the disruption. And it really gave us the opportunity um, not only to bring people together, but also um, to uh, ex share with them what, what was happening in the neighborhood of, of Northcote. Um, the community art installation on the bottom left is an example of, of something that, that we initiated at the beginning at Hobsonville Point quite early on as a way of, of bringing people together um, and then asking if it was something that community wanted to consider or wanted to take forward and we would just gradually step back. So for the last three or four years, um, we haven't been involved in it at all. And the local um, retirement village has taken ownership of it and they install it every year and, and, it, and it looks absolutely beautiful. Um, another uh, park design, this is in Northcote with Cadmus Loop Preserve. Um, it went through the same type of process as the one in Hobsonville Point. And at the bottom is um, in Porirua um, in Cannons Creek, where we're um, working with some community champions to um, help support the activation of what they call the cage, which is a really popular uh, basketball and volleyball space um, by putting in a container for them to be able to access equipment. And then on the grass base, um, a cube which is like a double container, um, an indoor space where they can have um, workshops and activities. Um, and so and that, that space will be community led as well it was something that they had um, uh, approached us about if we could support. Uh, I'll go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, our, our team also has um, a focus on, on youth as well, because we know that we're, we're in neighborhoods for, you know, in some of them 10 to 15 years. So um, those who are, are young kids at the beginning and going through this change in their neighbor, neighborhood will become adults, they'll become stakeholders, they'll become business owners, they'll become res, um, homeowners, they'll become, um, you know, parents potentially um, and in, in the school teaching so they're they're really important to us to have their voice now and to support them into the future as well so we've got a, a youth advisor within the team who um, helps advise on how to engage with youth but has also been doing a recent piece of work around well, what is Kaing Ora doing in, in, um, in that space with youth at the moment? And um, really just doing a stop take across the organization. And what we found is that there's actually quite a lot going on. But if you went on our website right now and said, oh, what are the opportunities for youth at Kaing Ora? You just won't see it because it's not actually all, all um, collated and in one place and under um, you know one really structured um, piece of work to say, this is our approach. So uh, that's a piece that he's working on at the moment that's um, currently looking at that internal stop take before we go um, external with that as well. Uh, the intention is to um, have youth uh, voice to shape that framework as well and is in the process of setting up what we call future squads um, where we'll go to those um, developments in Auckland at the moment um, to see uh, if there is youth that are interested in working with us on this, but those squads will also um, have the opportunity to um, inform the, de the developments that are happening around their, their area, but also building in some um, educational and leadership opportunities for them through that as well. Um, so that's a taste of um, what we've been doing so far. And I'll now hand over to Christine about her work now in terms of what the future may look like. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen, the old muted track. Um, Sophia, can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So yeah, as Kathleen said, Kainga Order is, um, is a reasonably new organization and um, was an amalgamation of three previous organizations. So, um, so one of the things that we are doing is developing, frantically developing new strategies to really think about how we want to work going forward. And one of the new strategies that was signed off, I think in July by our board is the community strategy, which has um, four key objectives 
to understand, support and enable the aspirations of Māori in our communities in relation to urban development, to develop good quality and well-functioning environments to live, work and play, to deliver operational and service excellence that support community well-being, and to build partnerships that revitalise communities. So uh, when I came on board, one of the key um, initial pieces of work that I um, have to achieve is to develop a placemaking framework for the organisation. And um, really looking at exactly when, why, how, and where we will um, undertake placemaking. At the same time, I have a um, colleague who is the Chief Advisor Community Development, who is um, developing a community development framework. So we're working really closely together to make sure that those two pieces of work are really integrated. And um, in fact, we are, we are even thinking about, is it one framework that has kind of two parts to it or is it two separate frameworks? So um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Sophia. Um, within Kainga Order, we have separate roles for stakeholder engagement, community development and placemaking, separate roles, separate teams even. Um, so um, there's quite a lot of confusion internally about, well, who does what, what's the difference? And, um, and even, you know, at our board level, they said to us, we don't understand. So can you, can you tell us when you would do what and why? So we just came up with this slide um, and this is specific to Kainga Order, um, just to try and demonstrate um, when something would sit with placemaking or when it would, you know, it would sit with stakeholder engagement, that kind of thing. So, and it's um, all of this work is just in its initial phases. So it's all first cut um, with lots of process to happen to pick it apart and review it and stuff. So we basically came up with at a very at a very simple level. Engagement is about building relationships. Community development is about building capability and empowering voice. And placemaking is about building quality and equitable places with, by, and for existing and future communities. Um, next slide, please, Sophia. So um, in terms of this work, we've done a bit of a kind of um, stock take of the current situation. And because, um, so as Kathleen said earlier, placemaking itself actually uh, came from HLC, it wasn't something that Housing New Zealand undertook. So um, at the moment, it's only mandated within our large scale projects of which there are eight around the country, six of them are in Auckland. So it's um, it, for the organisation as a whole, it's a, it's a reasonably um, new and unknown concept. And, and there was some community development undertaken within Housing New Zealand, but um, it was very varied. And um, so, so the stock tape has shown us that we have, in terms of our community work at the moment, uh, you know, we've got some parts of the country where absolutely nothing happens. And then we've got some examples of some really fantastic pieces of work. So, and everything in between. Um, we've got multiple teams working with varying levels of resource and very varying ways of working. And sometimes those teams are working um, almost in opposition to each other. Sometimes they're kind of falling over each other and um, there's a lot of work to do just to really um, clarify roles and, and ways of working. Um, as I said, there's some, there's some really good examples of good practice, but it's not consistent around the country. And we've been given really clear messages from our stakeholders and partners that they want us to engage more and they want us to be more visible in communities. Um, in terms of that, in terms of connecting with and collaborating with communities rather than just coming in and building a whole lot of houses and causing disruption. And we know that more partnerships and collaboration will enhance our success. So um, some, some very um, significant justification for doing this piece of work. Um, next slide, please, Sophia. So um, we, we're using a, a sort of a design, co-design approach to the work, and we're still in the discovery phase at the moment. We've done about 40 interviews, of which it's roughly half and half 
of um, internal people and external people. So we've got some really good um, data from those interviews, um, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Um, and, and the next step will be to start to workshop the material that we have to really pick it apart and um, challenge it and, and figure out what we like and what we don't like. Um, yeah, and, and the work is really looking at trying to address a whole lot of stuff like what are our levers and drivers, how how do we fund placemaking work, where should placemaking happen, like obviously it, it should happen um, a lot more than just in the large scale projects because there's some large scale projects within Kainga Order as a specific term for um, those projects that uh, that the old HLC were responsible for. And um, we're going to have a lot more, you know, big projects that, and, and even if they're not, you know, if they're not 300 houses, if they're only 50 new houses, then what should our role be in there? So all of that we need to look at. Um, the impact of COVID has, has actually been quite significant. And things like when should we be directly delivering a project or a piece of work and when should we actually be partnering with others to do that? So those are all things that we are exploring. Um, next slide, please, Sophia. Okay, so this is just a first cut. The next two slides are a first cut analysis of the information that we've had from the interviews. So we split them out into um, internal and external because we wanted to look at what are the consistent themes and what are some of the things that uh, our, I guess, our friends outside of the organization are telling us that, that we maybe um, aren't so aware of internally. Um, so just in terms of that, I mean, it won't be any surprise to any of you, I'm sure that, you know, some of the key things that are coming up in terms of um, what we really need to be focusing on are partnerships, collaboration, um, community-led practice, sustainability and, and the environment, um, innovation and, um, you know, uh, I guess, taking safe risks and capacity and capability building in communities. Um, some of the things, so I guess one of the interesting things is when we asked people internally about what the biggest challenges were and what we asked people externally, what they saw the biggest challenges and probably no surprise to anyone that resourcing came up by far the biggest challenge internally. And that's, um, it's probably more about people than it is even about money, although obviously money is an issue, um, because this how we staff our community work is, is really varied around the country and, um, you know, there's such a lot to do and um, in some areas they have one person for, you know, these huge geographical areas, so that's a challenge. Um, this idea of and target versus time is another big issue for us. And, you know, we're in a, as you all know, we're in a, a housing crisis where we have um, huge waiting lists for social housing and there just aren't enough houses. So we have a strong board and government imperative to get on and build houses as quickly as possible. And that can, that can be a real challenge for us in terms of taking the time to, you know, I think it was, I think it was Keegan earlier this week talked about, um, you know, helping people understand the importance of cups of tea and, um, and that lovely saying that frith, that I heard from frith, frith, although I don't think it came from her initially, she tells me, which is, you know, you have to move at the speed of trust. So the, trying to balance those things with, with this, <coughs> excuse me, strong imperative to get on and build houses can, can cause conflict. And um, yeah, and then the other, I think the other really strong issue is, um, and this is both internally and externally, because internally we have um, a lot of different, you know, we have urban designers and we have developers and we have planners and, um, and then we have community people and they all think about um, 
things from from their professional perspective and uh, how you know trying to move from that functional way of thinking to a holistic focus on place is is going to be a real challenge um, but it's a challenge that we're up for and there's a lot of there's a lot of goodwill within the organization um, and a lot of um, you know wanting to do the right thing um, in a context of quite significant pressure to get on and build houses. Um, and, and I guess another thing that I'll just talk about briefly is this informing rather than true engagement. So another challenge that we have is kind of when, when do we start engaging with communities? Because we start thinking about um, we might do something with this um, piece of greenfields or something, you know, and it could be and then there's years of process to get even to get to a point where it's approved to do something. And then it might be another five or 10 years before anything actually starts to happen. But, um, but if you wait too long, a whole lot of decisions and assumptions have already been made that um, the community have been left out of. So it's a real, that's a real challenge as well. Um, next slide, please, Sophia. So I just wanted to pick up on some of the key differences, I think, that um, from the people that we talk to who are external from the organisation. So just in terms of the values, those first three values came through really, really strongly internally, and they, was, and they certainly came through strongly externally as well. But the, the last three, reciprocity, social cohesion and equity, came through much more strongly from our, um, from our external interviews. Um, and, and partnership and collaboration, I think, came through really. So they were there in both, but um, I think there was a, a slightly different understanding, I think, of what we mean by that from our external and internal people. Um, and this um, concept of taking care of the well being of the land and the environment came through a lot more strongly externally as well and and this and the notion of sharing power which is which is always a struggle for a government organization um, and in terms of some of the challenges a big challenge that came through external from external people was the working with councils like councils are a, a key partner of ours and um, so we have to work really closely with them and particularly in the placemaking space if we're looking at infrastructure development, you know, if, if we're looking at developing a park or something, eventually we're going to hand that over to council. So, so we need to have them on board right from the start. And um, that can be a challenge in the, in the kind of environment where money is very tight and council aren't wanting to be um, saddled with extra assets. And, um, you know, I've I've got this lovely quote from from someone from a council who said it, it can be who was talking about how hard it can be working with a council, even when you're internal to council. And said to me, if you want to talk to council about a place, you not to, you need to talk to about twenty five of us. We come together and then we disappear back into our functions. So you know, just just like kind of order has the same issue. Um, any big organisation, I think. Um, you know, it's that how do you how do you get a focus on place instead of um, I'm thinking about my urban design hat or I'm thinking about my um, where I'm going to put the sewage pipe or that kind of thing. Um, and then consultation fatigue. Sorry, just realizing I'm taking up too much time. Consultation fatigue came through externally, so people who work really closely with communities are saying to us actually communities are sick and tired of being asked and consulted they actually want to see action um, and then lack of evaluation of our work um, so that's something we need to look at addressing in this too um, if you can go to the next slide Sophia please so just one of the, again this is very um, first cut of the data so but some of the things that have come through quite strongly that um, you know, we're, we're hoping these frameworks will attempt to try and um, address is some of the shifts that we want to make. So particularly, I think this 
what can we do to what can we do together? So instead of focusing on kinda order and kinda order is going to do this, it's how can we partner? How can we look at the whole um, landscape or the whole sector? You know, what can we do with council? What can we do with Manafino? Or what can we do? with philanthropic organisations and local community groups, that kind of thing, and have, instead of looking to partner to achieve our goals, how do we look to partner to achieve everyone's goals? Um, transactional to transformational, and I think this idea of um, sharing power and decision making, which is a challenge for a government organisation. And um, just a couple of other things that aren't on the slide is um, this notion of moving from a kind of a um, altruistic rescuing communities to actually trusting and believing in communities and a deficit focus to a strengths focus were a couple of other things that came through the data. Um, okay, if you can go to the next slide, please, Sophia. That's us and um, open to any questions, but we're particularly interested in any, remembering that this is a first cut, but any gaps that you see that you think are really significant and what um, input or influence could placemaking Aotearoa and other key stakeholders have in helping us to shape this work? And I see Keegan has his hand up. How are you? Hey, Bill Rowland. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so are you, or you go, Chris, uh, Sydney, sorry. Can just stay the course and run the market on Sunday? Oh, that's all right. C uh, Cindy, you might want to mute. Uh, yeah, cool. Hey, um, really, really appreciate that. And I, and I just wanted to talk or actually all those kind of challenges and struggles and focus areas uh, like super well like um, aligned with like a lot of what local government's going through too, just reflecting on our session yesterday. Um, the, the one thing that's, that stuck out for me was the, the term, you know, I don't have a solution for it, um, was the term place focus versus functional focus. And I think the, the inherency that it infers that place, putting a place focus is, is not uh, functional. Um, I, I suppose it just, um, I don't have an alternative word for it, arahomai, but um, it didn't quite sit well with me, um, just from my view. And just thinking, well, actually, a lot, a lot of what we're trying to do with placemaking, and, and particularly with your framework there, is trying to get a better fit for purpose um, of the the assets or the place to the community. Um, mm. And so it's making it more functional. Um, right. You know, yeah. Reflecting personally, you know, it's like if I, if if a community wants to pick, put a picnic table into a park, and our parks guys say that's going to get in the way of our mowing schedule. Um, it kind of goes back to, well, actually, what's the function of this park? Is it for people mm -hmm. to enjoy it and we want to encourage people there more? Or are we just trying to um, protect a certain standard of trimming? Um, yeah. You know, I'll just end it at that one as a bit of a, a facado there. Yeah, I think we mean function in a slightly different way. So you're right, we need to find a different word. Yeah. There were just a couple of questions in the chat that I've answered in the chat, um, Damien and Boopsie in particular. Yeah, sorry, I was just typing another comment and then I thought I'd just say it. So like, uh, I really appreciate how in depth um, you and Chris have been giving all that background and also even in your answers with land use, because I started off as a community member working with council for a public park. So I really, became interested in translating the land use, the length of progress process um, to everyday people. Cause every time you run into a local, they ask how long is it taking? How much does it cost? And it's how open you are about those two things. And I think you're doing a good job starting from the beginning in translating all that and even into new languages, but just in general, simplifying the diction, the word choice, I think really has been helpful and being honest that 25 people within a system will come out and then hide back in and you can't find them again or the worst is when they're on holiday or they switch roles and I really think with the size and scale of your projects and the public spaces you are managing um, relationships with that is a really important aspect to it because as a local who if that's your neighborhood and you own property nearby and you can't get a hold of the person that's in charge that yeah. that makes you lose faith and trust and I think the fact that you're openly saying that 
they come in and go back out and it's like a little turtle. <laughs> I, I pictured that. Um, yeah, I think that's the tricky, that's the hardest thing I have explaining is the time frames and the cost. Mm -hmm. And then who, and then when I present to council operating costs, that OPEX and CAPEX, right? And even just those words, translating that to your everyday renter. They don't even, I had to, my first council meeting, I had to Google those terms. I'm just hands up 2017. I had to Google CAPEX and OPEX. And so how do you translate it without making the person feel stupid? Yeah. So I really, I really appreciate all the slides you shared and all your transparency with the process. And I'll look more closely at the slides, but just the way mm. you talk about it feels more inclusive already, just your tone. Thanks. So thank you. Any other ideas? Might throw another one in there. All oh, right, no, you go. I just want to ask a clarifying question. I may have missed it because I was floating on letting people in and things like that. So I didn't listen all together closely all the time. But when you're talking about placemaking and actually community development, are you thinking about programming, utilizing, activating those spaces as much as the design and the delivery of the hard? So what's the relationship here with, for want of a better term, hard and soft? And is it just for the social housing that you're creating or for the whole neighborhoods because you've got really mixed neighborhoods that you're yeah. in. two questions Thank good you. questions i'll ask the second one first um and and it is something that um you know that we grapple with i think within some of our teams because we have people who have come from housing new zealand in the community development space who saw their roles very much as working with housing new zealand tenants or customers um and so the, the answer is no, it's whole communities because people people live in, people don't go, oh, I'm a kind order tenant. They they go, you know, I live in Mount Roscoe or whatever. So it's it's about whole communities um, because we want people to be and we want our, our tenants to be integrated into their communities. Um, but we do have to move people to um, we do have to move people, sorry, <laughs> lost my train of thought there. Um, yeah, we have to move our staff, some of them, to, to that bigger thinking, I think. Um, and in terms of your first question, it's definitely about activation and programming. And um, so it's, it's definitely both. Um, but, but we would also, we also need to think about how we move on from communities as well so so that's where the kind of I guess the um, strong community development focus comes in is how are we building capacity within communities so that um, so that th that kind of programming can continue without us yeah. all um, big challenges but but good problems to have is it all right to ask a question, Christine, that I know I know is um, your life, my life, and also Tamaki Regeneration's life? Um, the, the connection that we're trying to hold here with placemaking to the development team, to the design team, to the people who are actually the planners, to the people that are actually physically charged with the physical making, you sort of wonder if there's another little link for your chain on your diagram, but how, how is that working mm -hmm. for you guys? And is, is that something we can you know, support with that, that connection? Actually, that's a yeah, that's a really good. We we um, could and should put them in as another chain on the diagram. I think that would be really helpful. Um, Kathleen, do you want to talk about how? Or just briefly, um, another piece of work that's happening is uh, a, a um, urban design strategy is being developed. So I'm part of that um, team that's doing that, and. Um, and there's another piece of work as well, which I can't quite remember the name of it. But so there's there's lots of work happening across Kainga Order in that kind of strategy planning space. And we're trying really hard to link together and to make sure that everybody's talking to each other and that the pieces of work that we end up with are going to talk to each other. Um, but yeah, but yeah, there's, there's challenges within that as well um, in terms of, you know, um, one of the things that I um, 
so you know talk about all the time is how do we get our people into the beginning of processes instead of waiting until you've already made a decision and then you go oh well right let's get a placemaker in there um, and it's it's a it's different for the organisation so you know it's all um, change but I just wonder Kathleen do you want to talk about some of the sort of um, realities experiences of working yep. with planning? And, uh, Apologies, Frith, I didn't catch the beginning. I was busy responding to some of the chat there. So it was about working with those who are doing the physical delivery of um, of the spaces and, and how we work with them or what the challenges yeah. are. Especially the designers and the planners, I suppose, as, as Christine said, so it's not just us being called and going, we've made a place, can you activate it? The, the, yeah. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a meaningful place making conversation throughout the whole making of that place, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And as Christine says, it, it is actually getting better where we are in at those early conversations, um, and they um, really see the value of having us at the table as well, which is really cool. I guess the uh, the one of the challenges that we have is not so much the um, kind of the urban design and master planning teams, probably the development um, team who kind of have that overarching overview and responsible responsibility of the development of them. Um, getting really excited and thinking, oh, here's a placemaking project, go do it. And so, you know, and we're like, nah, that's not actually how it works. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it might be something really cool, but it's like, well, actually, that might not work here. Um, and so really kind of reining them into understanding how we make our decisions and um, and taking our advice on board. So um, it, it is getting better with, with them. And we have, um, you know, some really passionate people and really excited and again bringing us at the table at that early stage so it's taken a while a while to get there and there is definitely more of a conversation rather than being told this is what it is and you're going to deliver it so it, that's really exciting that we're you know we're at that point now too amazing work Um, can I just um, ask, uh, or also to talk all that, um, it's the old, if I had a dollar every time someone stepped into the office and was like, hey, can you just do that little thing that you do out in the community there, or send your mates out? Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure, that's how it works. Um, uh, the, I'm quite interested in um, actually all the kind of social capital that you guys are building through those um, projects, hey, and um, like, do you feel like you're, you guys are at a position where you're starting to just be the kind of a little bit of a conductor or a matchmaker that kind of connect a collaborator role where actually sometimes you're actually very much not in the center of anything or there's not, not necessarily any need for you to be in a partnership uh, level, but you're just connecting one part of this community to another part of this community and, and they're making the magic. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's something that um, we need to get better at as well. Um, not <clears throat> not kind of jumping in there and feeling like we're the knights in shining armor was a big fat checkbook um, that we are that more that facilitation and that connection. And um, it's something that's been identified through um, Christine's work and we are getting better at it, but there's certainly um, lots more improvement to do on that space as well, because that's all part of that um, sustainable future that we're not there to prop up and then it all collapses uh, once we move on. So we're definitely very mindful of that as is, is really, um, you know, coming in and, and supporting the community where it's needed, where it's asked for and, and not feeling like we're there to because we think it needs rescuing. Also, just wanted to talk or to your um, local Kainga Order Office. Their community engagement um, folk are absolutely fantastic. Um, we've kind of um, shared some uh, tools with them around play streets and other bits and pieces. Um, and I, I suppose a question on that is: um, Do you guys have like a um, like an internal community of practice across your community engagement folk and your placemakers um, to kind of share tools? And I suppose from a council perspective, it's like you know if um, your your fellows and local office here are doing some great stuff over um, over in Taranaki, for instance, with their council. You know, I'm I'm one of those jealous types that likes to compete. Um, so if we can do better than um, our colleagues in Taranaki, I'm always keen for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, we um, we have just, so funnily enough, um, Wednesday and yesterday, 
were supposed to be our first um, the launch of our community of practice and we had this big thing planned and we had the CE and the chair of the board were coming and it was going to be amazing and um, then lockdown happened and um, so we've so we've put the launch off till next year but we've had a couple of online um, sessions and we had one yesterday and someone from so and you know as part of those we're going to get people to present projects from around the country and someone from Kathleen's team presented a project from Mangere yesterday and the feedback was just overwhelmingly positive and um, people finding it really inspiring and so it was really good it was that was our the second one that we've had and the first one was a couple of months ago where we just where we first brought them together and um, in that first one there was a lot of kind of I'd say negativity and um, yeah so um, we were all feeling very good yesterday because it was much more positive and people were feeling really inspired so um, yeah. Can I just echo that um, sharing of tools not so much to compete and be better than um, <laughs> but you know that's as good as motivation as any I suppose um, but the sharing of tools is something at Placemaking RTO can easily do on our website so the learn page so you can upload things or send them to us I believe Sophia um, but I really want to sort of say also that you have this such a unique possibility and I've said this to you before because you manage neighbourhoods Councils kind of do and kind of don't, but you have so much influence at a neighbourhood level, and with the, um, you know, the proposed increased density and stuff, this is site by site stuff. You've got influence over that that building block of cities and places at the neighbourhood scale. So the tools that work for you, and I know you've got particular perspectives, and you come from government, and it's difficult to share power and things like that. But if you can share the tools that work, that can help other people to work well with you as well. So it's not all on you. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Please. <laughs> That's good. Absolutely. So we've got about um, three minutes before we need to end, which um, we can, you know, I mean, there's no reason why we can't end early if, if the conversation is at a finish, but it just, if, there is any last questions before we wrap up? I wonder if there is a, um, a good way to connect with you, Christian and Kathleen, if people have questions afterwards. What would you suggest doing? Um, we can... I can put it in the chat. I thought I'd put it in for in response to Chris's, but see, I did it as a direct message instead of to everybody. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. I can give you a and um, yeah. If it, if anyone misses it, I guess if you just go back to Sophia, she can share our email. So I will um, close us off with a karakia if we are finished and then everyone can get back to their day. So thanks for um, joining us today and thanks for listening. Um, okay. Unu hia, unu hia, unu hia ki te uru tapu nui, ki a wātea, ki a māma, te nāko, te tīnana, te wairua i te ara taungata, koe rā e rongo, whakaerea ki ronga, ki a tīna, tīna, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Good guys. See ya. See ya. See ya.